All right. Well, good to see so many friends. Um, yeah, I think I know all of you. I've seen you all in the little square. Hopefully we'll get we'll have the opportunity to meet each other in person soon. You're always welcome at Empty Cloud Monastery here in uh, New Jersey. And I wanted to thank uh, Derek for facilitating this as well as, well as Kelly. And uh, of course, to Venerable Chanda uh, for inviting me in the, in the first place to share some Dhamma with you all. And uh, so beautiful to see lovely community uh, supporting the bhikkhunis in, uh, in the UK and worldwide. So before we start talking about the topic today, which is a little bit of an intense topic, <laughs> I had forgotten that I had pitched that, <laughs> karma and female rebirth. Uh, so before we do that, maybe we can settle down our minds and um, uh, get into meditation posture and, um, and do some meditation today. We also have Stan the cat, our mon monastic cat from Empty Cloud that is joining us in the uh, in disguise <laughs> and yeah we can also send him some loving kindness since he's trying to heal a little bit from his multiple illnesses all right so when we're ready we can close our eyes and take a few deep breaths And we can start by relaxing the entire body from the top of the head to the tip of the toes. Releasing any tension we might be experiencing in the neck or in the shoulders, perhaps in the belly. Or maybe in the back. And we can slowly lift our attention to the breath. Observing every in-breath and out-breath. Noticing the quality of the breath, if it's coarse or subtle, or if it's short or long. Without trying for it to be anything other than it is, we just observe the quality of the breath as it is. If the mind tries to control the breath, for a moment we can just observe 
that physical sensation that comes from wanting things to be different than they are. The unpleasantness that comes with it. And seeing how unbeneficial it is, we can let go of that desire. And just observe the breath for what it is. It's just the way it is. If thoughts appear in the mind, you can just let them run their course without grasping at them, without wanting them to go away. And just let them be and keep our attention focused to the quality of the breath. Noticing how at each in-breath and out-breath, the entire body becomes bigger or smaller. Inflates and deflates.
And as we keep coming back to the breath, keeping our mind centered on the breath, we can acknowledge how the mind becomes more and more peaceful. And as the mind becomes more and more peaceful, the mind becomes happier and happier. So we can recollect how this happiness is always accessible to us. If we only put the right conditions in place, So we can wish for ourselves to always be happy. Always be peaceful. Always be well. Can bring a slight smile on our face. And really meaning it, we can shower ourselves with thoughts of loving kindness, wishing, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be safe. May I be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. And we can extend this wish to all the people meditating with us this evening or this morning or this afternoon, wherever we are in the world. Extending this wish of happiness to Venerable Chanda, practicing in Australia. Extending this wish to all the sentient beings that are in the room with us at the moment, whether humans or non-humans, may they all be happy. May we all be healthy, peaceful, and safe. May we all be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. And 
May we be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. Free from afflictions. And we can keep growing this loving kindness, this metta inside of our hearts, allowing it to imbue our entire experience, our entire mind and heart. And extending this metta to every single sentient being in every town, in every country, in every world system, beings with bodies, beings without bodies, human beings, animals, divine beings, hell beings, beings that are likable, beings that are dislikable. May all beings have happy minds. May all beings be well, happy and peaceful. for their benefit and the benefit of others. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings uproot greed, hatred, and delusion and develop wisdom. May all beings attain blissful supreme Nibbana. May all beings be well and happy.
And we can dwell in this divine abiding of loving kindness for a few more moments. And without letting go of our metta, we can slowly open our eyes and come out from formal meditation practice. All right. Well, at this time, you can stretch a little bit if you need to and drink some water if, if you like. And um, so tonight, I think last time we were saying about also allowing um, more time for Q&A. So maybe I'll share some preliminary thoughts and then we can, um, I'll keep it short. I'll try to keep it short and then um, we'll take it from there. And in the meanwhile, you can gather all your either questions or comments and we can have a little bit more of a conversation. But before we begin, we can start by paying homage to our original teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa buddham tamam sangham namasami hmm. So mm, the topic tonight uh, was um, is about kama and um, female rebirth. So I wanted to share a few words about actually bad karma. It's um, a very interesting sort of refrain that we hear in uh, many, many Buddhist circles. Um, sometimes actually we don't hear about karma altogether uh, because of all these like different pernicious views that can happen in uh, the circles where we talk about karma. And, um, you know, it, it's very interesting because being in um, being a monastic and obviously frequenting a lot of different, uh, more traditional Buddhist settings, um, one of the refrains that we hear a lot is the sort of correlation between um, being reborn as having the birth, so the shape and form of a woman and its correlation with uh, with bad karma. But then when you go to, you know, sort of more Western environments, um, you can also hear certain ideas such as, oh, it's bad karma to be uh, born as a person of color, or it's bad karma to be born as a LGBTQ person. Um, and so then in Asia, we hear a lot, it's bad karma to be to be born as a woman. And, <laughs> but never have I heard any, you know, for example, Ajahn uh, in, um, in Thailand or any um, teacher, any Bhante from, from Sri Lanka say anything about it being bad karma to be born a, of a person of color and so forth. So I was I was very much interested in um, in how at the very beginning I was like, so what exactly is this bad karma? So what exactly is it? Seems a little bit um, changing from setting to setting, and there doesn't seem to be um, one kind of main type of type of view. I mean, it really depends on the different contexts, and when one actually looks. Um, at the suttas, we see that uh, first and foremost, what we normally use as the word in parlance karma, this is good karma or bad karma, um, it's actually, if anything, good vipaka or bad vipaka. 
Um, so karma actually is the word, the Pali word kamma, uh, or karma in the Sanskrit word for an intentional action. And vipaka is actually the result of an intentional action that can happen either immediately uh, or a little um, later on within this life or perhaps in future lifetimes. And so oftentimes what we kind of talk about in terms of um, what we say, this is good karma or bad karma is actually very much vipaka rather than, uh, than, it, rather than kamma. And even when we're talking about vipaka, there is a lot of speculation. And the reason why I pretty much um, mentioned how there were these discrepancies, even uh, um, in something like, for example, being born a person of color, where actually the Buddha was born a person of color. <laughs> so clearly, I don't think it was bad karma to, to be born as the Buddha, as a person of color. <laughs> Uh, or Upalavana Kema were born um, as women with female bodies, and actually, they you know were enlightened women. Definitely not bad karma, I would say. <laughs> Definitely not bad vipaka, whatever we want to call it. And in fact, actually, there's nothing along those lines that we can have we can find in the early texts. There's nowhere in the Pali Canon that I'm aware of that could find um, that is at least not in the commentaries that actually traces any kind of correlation between having a particular body and um, it being the product of, so, so to speak, good or bad karma. The body is just the body and it's just a result of other, um, other conditions that have nothing to do with something being um, good or bad. Obviously, the only thing that we see in the, in the sutta is that it comes close to Mm. drawing an association between having between the condition of of being a woman and um some sort of bad karma is actually said by mara <laughs> and it's said by mara to bikuni soma from whom i get my name from so while bikuni soma is meditating um mara comes up to her and and tells her uh, what are you doing there trying to achieve what is difficult to be achieved by the by the wise ones one who is a woman is not capable of, of achieving essentially the same state um, because a woman essentially has very little wisdom and uh, bikuni soma's um, reaction since she's fully awakened she first and foremost recognizes mara immediately and then tells him what does womanhood have anything to do at all when the mind is concentrated well and sees right into Dhamma? One who thinks I'm a woman, I'm a man, or I'm anything at all is fit for Mara to address. So clearly, whenever we, we hear these um, sort of pernicious views, whether it's being a woman, whether it's uh, being a person of color, whether it's uh, LGBTQ person, etc. We have to keep in mind that there's nothing along those lines in the early teachings of the Buddha. And so I recommend for all of us to, uh, you know, remember Bikuni Soma, uh, the Arahant uh, reaction and go, hmm, I see you, Mara, talk to my hand <laughs> and be impermeable to it. But at the same time, also, it's important, I feel, as Buddhists to actually inform um, ourselves and inform fellow Buddhists about what actually are the teachings of, of the Buddha. And also when we um, see different people that are experiencing different stages of suffering, that perhaps it's not the most skillful thing to um, maybe, you know, tell them that it's their bad karma, that they're experiencing this, um, or that any kind of speculation that we're having. As a matter of fact, actually, the Buddha in the early text is quite clear with uh, the lay disciple, Miga uh, Zala. Actually, there's a, there's a sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya where uh, there is this lay disciple, Miga Zala, who is going on a lot of speculation about the different um, actions of people and their mm, uh, leading them to different types of destinations. And the Buddha is very quick at telling her um, to stop that crazy behavior and that only someone like him can actually understand and know what 
action essentially um, has produced one particular result. And so when we actually engage in that type of thinking, um, it's very dangerous. When we go into the mm, drawing, you know, telling people they are experiencing what they're experiencing based on previous actions that they've done in the past, it's, it's a big field of, of speculation uh, that in the best you know, case scenario, it's a sort of, um, it doesn't have too many impacts, but in the worst case scenario, actually, we are the ones who are committing a bad action because we're doing something that is um, harmful um, and definitely not, in, in, not quite beneficial. So the Buddha actually says that, you know, karma is one of those imponderables and that if we get into these kind of lines of speculation of trying to draw uh, too many connections between um, causes and consequences, our head might explode. And that's because we're not enlightened beings. So perhaps best case, <laughs> the best thing to do is actually not to engage in that um, to begin with, uh, but rather be very, 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 very skillful. And actually, how about we see how the Buddha talks about um, Kama? Why don't we actually lead by example, uh, sorry, uh, follow the example and then lead by example and you know for example when in the like famous Angulimala Sutta uh, when the Buddha encounters Angulimala who uh, notoriously had been killing many many different people and um, had done um, was notoriously like bringing um, wearing all these uh, jewelry essentially made out of the fingers of all the people that he had killed so clearly someone who had made who was making lots of uh bad deeds and committing lots of bad deeds well the first thing that buddha says is he doesn't say that it's well you know the fault of his victims that went on the way of angulimala and uh it's probably the bad karma of all the <laughs> of all the victims that have done really bad things in the past or he also doesn't tell angulimala to wait for his next life because clearly you know there's no hope for him after everything that he's done but rather he has a different different type of attitude first and foremost he establishes um uh, angulimala in Dhamma, first and foremost, he tells Angulimala to stop. First and foremost, he encourages Angulimala to see that um, he's to acknowledge that he's doing something that he has done, bad deeds, and to stop killing sentient beings. So establishing someone, once again, in non-harming is extremely valuable in the, in the, in the teachings of the Buddha. So not focusing on the victim, but rather focusing on the perpetrator. So we have no idea what <laughs> all the victims of Angulimala had done in the past. And the Buddha didn't seem, didn't point clearly through his actions, didn't feel like that was relevant at all. Because what we know and what we see is that someone is committing something really unwholesome and that we can denounce and that we can say that is bad karma clearly right so even the buddha who clearly knew all the the past karma of all the the different sentient beings that angulimala had harmed um even though he probably knew all of these uh different causes and consequences didn't think it was necessary or relevant to point it out and then at the same time, we see that Angulimala, um, once he's an enlightened being, or actually once he's someone who uh, has become a monastic and uh, then goes to town on alms and sees uh, a woman experiencing uh, a lot of trouble uh, giving birth, even there he doesn't talk about the first thing that he says is not, oh, well, by the way, you must be having this really troubled uh, birth because uh, of your past bad karma. And so this is your horrible vipaka that you're there. Okay, see you later. Maybe wait for next life uh, in order to be established in Dhamma. But no, actually, the first instinct that he has is out of compassion, understanding that the human experience is an experience of affliction. And so the first instinct that he has is to once again establish the person in Dhamma and tell them, um, obviously, after consulting with the Buddha, and he shares with her 
that since he has um, taken this new birth, this noble birth um, as a monastic, he has never intentionally killed any sentient being. So giving us the sort of teaching that how powerful it is right here, right now to practice the Dhamma, regardless of what we've done in the past. Right now it's our, our new uh, our new birth essentially as practitioners. And right now we have the right information to be able to practice in accordance to, with Dhamma, to be able to, to do um, actions that have good results. And once again, he did not uh, focus on, on speculating on what led um, the, this woman to have a troubled, a troubled um, pregnancy. So it's very important to, uh, to somewhat follow that example, to keep that in mind, uh, that that is what we should be doing. Understanding that the human condition is actually the product of both quote unquote, good and bad karma that we've done in the past is this mixed state of existence. It's something that has a lot of pleasant um, mm, results and also a lot of unpleasant results. And so we're sometimes experiencing pleasure, sometimes we're experiencing pain. And each one of us has done very good, skillful things, obviously, uh, to have the product of a human rebirth and definitely to have encountered the Dhamma. But also each one of us has done a good fair share of unskillful deeds, both to have a human rebirth as a consequence, but also because we're not enlightened yet. So clearly, <laughs> uh, we've got a little bit confused along the way. So who are we to actually start judging others on what they have done or what they've said and, and so forth? And also realizing that these are just impermanent states of existence. And perhaps this time around, we, you know, maybe we might have some wealth, maybe we might have um, whatever it is, social status and so forth, whatever we think that is um, a somewhat good condition, but that will be impermanent. That is impermanent. That is something that will fade away. And so very important to um, recollect that we have the Dharma and recollect that we know what kind of actions we can do that lead to um, a sort of good result and focus on, on doing rather than, than going, oh, okay, well, this is like my, my terrible <laughs> uh, bad karma and that's it. So that I am petrified and so forth. Because this is one of the, I've, mm, I've observed uh, both in others and also in myself, actually, at the very beginning of the path, when I started entertaining thoughts of like, oh, it's really, maybe it's really bad karma that I was born a woman and maybe I have less opportunities to practice than others. And that can lead actually to a sort of static, uh, to a kind of like more um, way of that we think it's accepting we think that it's equanimity but instead it's actually non-action then in and of itself is karma altogether and it's a karma that doesn't lead us towards awakening it's a karma that is the opposite of practicing right effort which is one of the components of the noble eightfold path and so we have that kind of resignation well not not very particularly productive to actually um yeah, to actually develop all the factors that we need to develop along the way. And right now we might have whatever kind of body we might have, but it's a body that is actually extremely useful. It's a human body and it's a human body that um, is, however in good or bad shape it is, <laughs> it can be very useful to, to actually practice the Dhamma that right now we have the opportunity to have. So if we take too much of a kind of passive stance on it, then we will lose the opportunity and also actually possibly make even more kamma, uh, even more actions of mm, that will impede us, that will actually make real concrete obstacles along the way that then will prevent us from finding the Dhamma again in the future. So we see that getting back to uh, Angulimala, actually Angulimala and that beautiful sutta, mm, the Buddha, he tells him that uh, he encourages him to recollect how beautiful it is when someone who is established in wrong view then becomes established in right view and starts 
making really good actions um, and becomes this sort of light in the world. So we all have that, that opportunity. Why would we wish, actually, he encourages, um, says even you know, our enemies, we should encourage them to, to be established in Dhamma. Even the most awful people in the world, we should wish for them to be established in, in Dhamma, to practice the Dhamma, so they would stop harming themselves and others, right? It's, it's very, it's the most wise thing to do, and we don't need to mm, wait to be enlightened to kind of understand the importance of, of these teachings, the importance of actually um, encouraging, facilitating the, the practice of Dhamma to as many beings as we can. So when we get into, you know, for example, the debate of uh, bhikkhuni ordination being valid or not valid, of course, it becomes to me so ridiculous in a way. <laughs> I'm like, why wouldn't we want more people renouncing in the world, right? <laughs> we should aspire for as many people as possible to, to be renouncing, to be practicing the Dhamma uh, in a, in a full-time way not less people. We should want even the, the people who are not interested in practicing the Dhamma to practice the Dhamma. <laughs> and if they're actually interested and they want to renounce even more so, um, then we would have even more opportunities to have enlightened beings in the world. I think we're all aware about climate change. We're all aware about the, the imminent apocalypse that we're living in. Do we want more enlightened beings in the world? I think so. I think so. I think that would be make everything a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more sane, a little bit more, a little bit less apocalyptic, right? So <laughs> when we get into instead um, impeding people from practicing or creating obstacles, along the way for them to, to practice, that is bad karma. So it's not bad karma to be born in one shape or form. It's bad karma what we're doing right here, right now. Impeding people to practice, clearly not a good idea. Clearly nowhere. No, there's no precedent in the suttas because obviously that's not something that is in, in, in accordance with dhamma. So yeah, I would say... You know, I've been thinking a lot of it. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, I had, I was pondering a lot. Is it bad karma to, is it actually true? Is it bad karma to be a woman? And I have to say, I've been pondering this for, for so long uh, through studies and also through my mind. And I'm like, no, actually it's great. <laughs> it's great. I am so happy to be a bikuni. Uh, I think it's actually an incredible um, state. Um, <laughs> it's incredible actually place and an incredible ordination to have uh, right here right now in this day and age if one has the right intentions because actually for the most part in Theravada countries it's outside for example of uh, organized religion so if someone has a true dedication to to practice as a renunciant in the way that the Buddha you know established these forms of bhikkhu and bhikkhuni then Bikuni is great, yeah, you know, much less praise, honor, gain, that is bitter, vile, obstructive to awakening, as the Buddha says over and over again. So yeah, sometimes it can be a little bit painful for our ego, right? People don't treat us as great as um, the bhikkhus. And whenever I catch my mind going like, oh, poor me, I'm like, yeah, great me. <laughs> That's excellent. Less distractions so many less distractions, less temptations. And, you know, as women, we can have so many great opportunities outside of monastic life to actually um, achieve praise, honor, and gain. So if we become renunciants, regardless of our gender, regardless of our sex, regardless of our bodies, the purpose of this form is awakening. So the fact that actually this form doesn't have as much praise and gain as the uh, bhikkhu form is actually incredibly good karma. I must have made a vow <laughs> in my past life. But yeah, because it's it makes life incredibly easier, less distractions, and once again, more, more rooted in dhamma. So I'm just sharing all of these as, as reflections, as food for thought. And now we can kind of like, open it up a little bit. Um, but mm, I just want to end that sometimes it's very important to reflect on what we really think is even 
good karma and good vipaka and what is bad karma and bad vipaka because we can be very very much confused and um sometimes you know our worldly ideas of what is good and um and what is bad is not necessarily in line with dhamma and so this is just a fascinating it's my call and always to uh, to investigate a little bit the dhamma and my my experience um based on based on all of all of these kind of rumors that we hear in Buddhist circles. And at the same time, I think it's very important to have conversations of this, this sort so we can all kind of clarify or express any doubts that we might have. So if anyone wants to um, comment or say anything at all or ask questions. Oh, Janaki, good to see you. Start with Janaki. <clears throat> okay. so, um, <clears throat> uh, regarding this gender issue, I don't think there is any valid evidence or proof, even in modern science uh, or in Buddha's teaching, that there is a difference between the female and the male. Uh, when it comes to the mind or the thinking power or the wisdom or whatsoever. But physically, yes, physically, of course, the man has a, a strong physique and the woman is gentle. Um, and also, we all know that usually children and uh, older people and as well as men and women both, they find, you know, some comfort in the company of the females rather than in the male, especially in, uh, if you look at uh, small children, you can see that clearly. And um, the Buddha never um, uh, treated women as inferior. Um, that's why he even in Metta Sutra, he, he clearly said that if you want to love a share Metta with anybody or to care for the others, to treat that person uh, as how a mother uh, who cares for her only child or her child with her own life. Imagine with her own life, that's what the Buddha said. So why didn't he uh, choose the word like the father does? Because the fathers, they have the physique and the you know, strength and to do anything or to defend anything. But he didn't say that, he said mother, because of the metta, that kindness, that softness. And also we know in the, if you take the today's world, uh, when you go for wars, no, or it is always the men who go for wars, bloodshed, um, hunting, blood sports, um, all sorts of things, even uh, raping uh, women, children. Uh, but the women, you, you, you don't find that to that extent, maybe very few occasions. So it shows that they are a gentle, um, uh, I mean, fraction of the uh, humans, but um, uh, whereas the man always go for uh, those kinds of things. So there is nothing whatsoever to say that the women, uh, a woman is inferior than the man. Um, it must have been some later introduction from the Brahminism. So that's why even when the Buddha was, um, and Bodhisattva was looking at the uh, Pasmaha Balum, you know, the, the five things, the mother, um, he, he checked the mother, who the mother is, and the, the class to which he should be born, and the area and the country. Likewise, there were five things, but he didn't uh, check, uh, I mean, decide who the father should be. It's the mother. So there is a meaning for that. There should be a reason for that. And also, he should have been born in the Brahmin caste, but he, no, he didn't, didn't want to. He wanted to be born uh, in the Kshatriya, that means the royals, the, the rulers. So because the, the Brahmins don't get mixed up with the common people in the country, and they used the language Sanskrit in India at that time. But the royals, they were the rulers. They could break the rules or make the rules. So they had the power to do any of those things. So that was the best um, class system that he should be born as a human being. So all in everything in Buddha's life, there is a reason, uh, a reason which we can prove. 
uh, that it's right or wrong. And also, according to modern science too, uh, if you read up the scholarly articles of the recent findings, you can see how the children, when they are born, uh, from whom they inherit the, the intellectuality or the so many capabilities, whether it is from the mother or the father. So I'm not going to uh, tell about these things, but because it has been already found and documented. So because of that, I mean, there is nothing. I honestly don't know why there is a big issue about, you know, uh, against the Bikuni uh, Sasana or Bikuni Sangha, because actually speaking, it is, it is just, a, it's just nonsense because they don't, do not understand the Buddha's teachings properly, that is the reason, that is the delusion. That's, that's the only word that I can find. But I don't know whether uh, I assume I would agree with me or not. But anyway, this I can prove those things, but uh, I just want to uh, make it clear in a, I mean, in a nutshell and in, a very, in very simple words. I mean, you yourself can go and find out anyone uh, by some of the things that I have said. Take the examples and look at the world and find out um, is there anything contra contradictory uh, in what I said uh, um, with uh, the Buddha's teachings. So, so. Thank you very much, Janaki, for, for your sharing. Uh, I will just address a few things that you have said um, that uh, yeah, it's very important to acknowledge that there are differences between um, each one of us uh, and that equality in terms of like um, the accessibility of, of awakening doesn't seem doesn't mean sameness and that we don't have all the, the same traits. Uh, this being said, all these, um, you know, different traits are dependently arisen and sometimes gender has a play in that sometimes it doesn't so um you know I would I'm a little bit wary to say <laughs> you know women are superior in terms of compassion to men not that you said that but like sometimes there are these statements or that um women are better or worse or that men are better or worse in anything uh, a lot of them are actually sometimes culturally dependent so as a foreigner in the united states um running an international monastery there are so many things that actually do not align uh, with gender altogether um and so especially a lot of mm, modern women including myself actually i have a bit of a hard time with uh, with children, so <laughs> I never had a, a motherly instinct. But in my previous life, within this life, working in fashion, nobody was expecting me to have a motherly instinct. But then, once I entered the Buddhist world, everybody was assuming that I was really good with children. And a lot of actually monastics too were like, oh, we should have a children's program. Ayasoma, definitely, because we need more bikunis because they're good with children. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> so actually then um, we had uh, some Sri Lankan bikus that were here that were actually really good with children doing the children's program when we did, when we had it. And it was not because they were male uh, or, or female or we didn't have other females. It just so happened that the bikunis that were present when we were doing these children's program, one of them was me. Um, we just didn't have maternal instincts but on the other hand, the Sri Lankan bhikkhus who were present um, had maternal instincts as opposed to Bhante Sudhasu, who just doesn't really have many, I, I don't even know that maternal instinct is the right, <laughs> is the right, um, right term, but like being good with children, I guess I would say, or having that metta towards children. Um, so sometimes actually I would have, I will have a lot of metta for, for a child, uh, similar, similar to the, the metta sutta, but sometimes uh, then it's an adult. Um, so the age range doesn't affect me as much. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is that lots of things I feel have to do mm, with many, many different Everything is dependently arisen, the Buddha teaches, right? That's dependent origination. 
everything um, that we're experiencing is not permanent. It's not who we are and is constantly changing. There are certain traits that might seem um, specific to a group of people, but once again, those specific traits might vary, very, very a lot uh, based on different cultures, based even on different age ranges, you know? For example, I grew up in, in Italy in um, still a time and place where actually there are specific gender roles for women. Um, so I grew up with two older brothers and they know how to, you know, fix things in the house, how to like use power tools, etc. And I have zero knowledge of that. But I came to the United States and actually the average women, woman <laughs> who is younger than me knows how to do a lot of all these things. <laughs> and the average male paradoxically has no idea um, <laughs> to my surprise. So sometimes when we had, you know, residents actually at Buddhist Insights in our first um, place in when we were doing retreats my mind out of these gender roles was you know looking for the dudes to do the work <laughs> they were completely incapable like we had a plumbing emergency for example and they were just like I don't know I don't even know how to close the water and I'm like how are we going to do it and then these women would come and they just knew everything about plumbing <laughs> so it just has to do with uh yeah, with different things. In terms of like the strength of the body, it really depends on how are we mm, classifying? How are we, what kind of mm, meters are we using to classify strength? Um, so there's different types of strength. I mean, actually giving birth is apparently, I never gave birth to anyone, uh, but I've heard that's actually one of the most painful, like, really in, it requires a lot of endurance it requires a really strong strong body and apparently a male body is un completely incapable of dealing with that type of aside from the fact that they cannot give birth to a sentient being but even if it did like an equivalent type of bearing of, of um, hardship would be very difficult so if we you know, change the sort of parameter through which we uh, we establish strength, then it's not necessarily true that a male body is superior, quote unquote, in strength to a female body. It just depends on what kind of situation uh, the body is encountering. Um, living in a gender inclusive monastery, uh, I'll end by saying that my experience is that we all have greed, hatred, and delusion. <laughs> <laughs> and it just manifests in different shapes and forms. Um, and some of them are also based on having a slightly different body. So I like to joke that some of my um, fellow male practitioners have IMS, which is not the um, Insight Meditation Society retreat center, but rather irritable male syndrome, which actually you should Google it. It's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not as famous as the PMS, uh, premenstrual syndrome. So, but it actually manifests exactly in the same way, like waking up and being irritable for no reason whatsoever, except for <laughs> hormonal imbalance. And so there's just, um, yeah, different, different, different triggers, but we're all essentially experiencing pretty much the same shade of dukkha um, is just... Yeah, it's just that sometimes we focus too much on the details rather than on the essence of the dukkha. And, you know, if it weren't this the case, then the teachings of the Buddha would not be applicable to each one of us. And one last thing about gender is actually when we reflect, when we talk about animals, for example, if we see cats. Actually, does anyone know if he's a male or a female? <laughs> I see he's a he because I just gendered him. <laughs> but literally, so many people go like, even if they know his name is Dan, they might refer to him as she. So when we look at animals, we're kind of a little less 
caught up with this whole gender thing. We're like, it's a cat. <laughs> and that's basically the Vasetta Sutta uh, for all of us, which is a beautiful sutta that the Buddha teaches, where it's all about that, how we create all these differentiations and we get caught up with all of these differences between human beings. When actually by action, one becomes a Brahmin, the Buddha says in that, in that sutta, not by birth. So there's, yeah. We, we classify sentient beings, you know, there's groups of cats, there's groups of fish, and then there's groups of humans. And we can't see many differences between humans based on color of the skin, based on gender, based on whatever it is. Anyway, I'll shut up because I said that it was going to be short, but then I just keep on talking and I'll pass it on to Rob, who is raising his hand. I'll be nice and short and sweet, I promise. Um... Yeah, I just wanted, I just going back to what you were saying about um, when you changed your perception of being a bikini, bikini. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right now. Um, and uh, looking at the advantages rather than the disadvantages. And that obviously affects kind of how you're suffering about that situation. So if you're not praised all the time, then obviously that, that leads to a certain, um, the, the ego being tamed a little bit. So I was just wondering um, <clears throat> whether there's much in the suitors about how you can change or alter your perceptions in order to reduce your suffering. Okay, yes, wonderful. Thank you, Rob. I would say the Dhamma is all about that. <laughs> but rather than changing our perceptions, identifying our perceptions. So seeing how something is dependently arisen. So for example, mm, you know, prior to monastic life, um, actually, as a lay person, I basically lived my entire life through what I basically designing the life that I liked. So following all my likes and uh, trying to avoid as much as possible all my dislikes. So I used to work in fashion and I was behind the scenes. Um, so doing editorial work and interviewing people, et cetera, et cetera. And always despise doing anything like remotely even close to what I'm doing currently right now. <laughs> or spoke, speaking, for example, in public was absolutely terrifying to me. And by public, I mean a crowd larger than two people. So it was just absolutely something that I never wanted to do or wished to do and I thought I was you know um independent woman <laughs> following um my aspirations and uh, you know I also moved to the land of the free the United States you know and exerting my freedom of um, doing whatever I wanted and I was miserable as a lay person too <laughs> I was, you know, living where I wanted, with the job that I wanted, with the relationships I wanted, whatever I wanted, and I was unhappy. So as a monastic, then it just so happened that all of a sudden, for different reasons, um, I was kind of thrown, well, first of all, actually, you can't hide, because... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the small print that they don't put in the ordination um but that you read afterwards you're like oh all of a sudden you're a public figure to a degree or the other in the way that this form also is very meaningful to many people so even if you're going around the street simply uh, and you encounter um, Asian Buddhists well you won't pass unnoticed whether you're a monastic whether you're a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni um, so there is that. And then also I was running an organization, different, anyway, um, different conditions. And all of a sudden I was thrown in the, in the kind of spotlight to, to a degree or the other. And while I was, um, also being in a gender inclusive monastery, so with a lot of bhikkhus and a lot of bhikkhunis and a lot of male practitioners and female practitioners and trench transgender folks as well. I just started noticing some patterns actually. Um, and for example, that <laughs> um, any um, woman who would take on the robes, for example, even after a while, uh, she had a, a really hard time in receiving things as a monastic or being exposed to being sort of at the center mm, of attention. But, uh, someone with a male body <laughs> they weren't even a samanera right there and they were like oh yeah thank you oh sadhu oh yes <laughs> and I was like oh what an interesting thing what a, an interesting kind of 
peculiar, <laughs> peculiar thing or being feeling very confident in front of uh, the public or feeling very confident even when talking about things that they had no idea what they were talking about. And conversely, instead, um, women having a lot of insecurity unless they were 250% you know, qualified about the subject matter to actually say anything. And so that it kind of occurred to me, always going back to the Dhamma of saying, hmm, everything is dependently arisen. So what are the causes and conditions that create this result? So we tend to think I am the confident person. I am the person who likes to speak in public or I am the person who's shy or I'm this or I'm that. But in reality, we are none of that. <laughs> Those are temporary conditions that are dependently arisen. So if we see what are the conditions that bring to a particular result, then we can be in, um, very intentional about it. And that's basically Dhamma practice. The Buddha tells us these are the things that need to be developed, put these conditions in place in order to develop them. And those, of course, are, you know, kind of um, brush strokes that the Buddha gives us because he couldn't like particularly say, well, if you live in the UK in 2022 in this particular town and with these friends, like he doesn't go into those details, but rather it's brush strokes so that we can understand what to put in place. But we have to see, we have to always constantly look at our mind and see, is this beneficial? Does this lead to suffering or the cessation of suffering? So for example, right now, I do a lot of things that I uh, don't like, like speaking in public, but it's actually needed. So now my dislike for it is becoming less and less because actually, instead of following <laughs> my likes and dislikes. And so instead of making karma that leads to the same result, uh, I'm just actually focusing on what is currently needed. What is this, is this beneficial or this is not beneficial? So tonight, for example, it's beneficial because uh, thanks to me being here, Aya Chanda can actually take a nice break and be on retreat. Um, so, wow, that's great. Ah, a ready cessation of suffering in my mind just by recollecting this, um, this thought, right? So this is good. This is a really great thing. And hence also the fear of saying something silly, the fear of like not being the best teacher in the world, the fear of being, you know, uh, inadequate, all of that. It's like, ah, who cares about that? Whatever. I see you, Mara. <laughs> I won't be the first nor the last uh, practitioner to say something silly or to say something obtuse. Um, so that's that's not, not, it's irrelevant. That's just the ego that is talking. That's just something that I want to be X, Y, and Z. So I would say that definitely always looking, always going back to the Dhamma, always looking at um, the results and what are we putting in place in order to get those results. Essentially, we see the product of the recipe and from the recipe, we deduct the, the recipe. <laughs> And uh, then if we don't like the product, if we don't like the cake and we're like, oh, we want to make pizza, then we won't, you know, instead of sugar, we will put salt in the flour. And instead of like, um, I don't know, raisins, we'll put tomato. <laughs> so we'll correct the initial recipe and we'll have pizza instead of the cake. But we won't be surprised that, oh, there is the cake. I am the cake and I will always be a cake. No, we're like, we want to be a pizza. So let's put the, the ingredients for the pizza in place. So I hope that answered your, your question. <laughs> right? And Nietzsche or Nissi, Nikki. Nikki. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> I know. I always get called Nisi. <laughs> Should change my spelling. Thank you. Um I, I want I want you were kind of answering as you were talking then. Um, but this oh, I wondered if you could um Fill in some gaps here for me. I, I recently went on holiday um, about two weeks ago. Went, hadn't been away since before COVID. Had no break for a long time. So I went on this walking trip in, um, abroad where there were strangers, didn't know them. And I had slight anxiety about going. Um, and then I got there, and I think there were about a group of 15 people. They didn't know each other either. I had a really horrible experience for eight days, um, which was, uh, I mean, when I've come back and reflected on it and talked it through, I was really judged 
as um, I think it was maybe my hair or my tattoos. It's all I can understand. I, I'm not quite sure um, because I, I mean I was asking people because I was getting it was what well, it was constant. It was really bizarre. And so as you were saying, um, and it was horrible. It was really hurtful and. Um, exclude I felt really excluded and different but I didn't go there with that I went there with an open heart I had no idea that people still did that I was really quite shocked so I was kind of just getting on with it you know being my you know really happy and then it was just bizarre um so when you talk about causes and conditions and and not not that I want I'm not going to blame myself for other people's actions but I wonder if I was re on reflecting on that I wonder if there's something about having an expectation that that might happen yeah yeah okay you know it so therefore does that somehow cultivate it happening on some level I don't mean on a conscious level but subconscious yeah well, thank you, Nikki, for sharing that. And I'm sorry that you had to go through that unhappy, unpleasant experience. Um, when Ajahn Pasanno, who is a very senior monk, actually the most senior disciple of Ajahn Chah here in the United States and an incredibly mm, developed practitioner, really very inspiring to me. Uh, when he came to visit us, actually, he gave a really beautiful um, explanation of patience, of Kanti. Uh, we tend to think, okay, I'm mean, just enduring everything and, you know, like be bearing this big burden on my shoulder. But instead, he was like, how about we actually think about Kanti, about patience as just lowering our expectations? And that was, I found it so useful, so helpful. First of all, to realize how many expectations we have that are completely unrealistic. You know, we just expect the entire world to be enlightened when we're the first ones not to be <laughs> enlightened, right? <laughs> like, oh, may all these people not have any prejudices, um, but it's fine if I have prejudices and I don't even think about my own prejudices. <laughs> and may everyone always uh, be kind and sweet and and never, you know, use a speech in an unhelpful way when, you know, we just kind of always open our, our mouth and stick foot to the mouth. So we have all these unrealistic expectations. Um, but if we actually start the morning with zero expectations, it's great because then anything we have is like, you know, thumbs up. We're like, oh, today nobody insulted me or today only one person insulted me that's great <laughs> and I've encountered 10 people today so nine people actually did not insult me only one person insulted me that's wonderful or like even if nine people out of 10 insult me well at least one person didn't insult me that's incredible <laughs> that's excellent and so forth so that's kind of like an attitude that we should always be be cultivating so definitely I've been taking that at heart in my mind monastic life I've been happier and much happier um, in dealing with it so that is one aspect and I feel like um, should be central but at the same time we should keep in mind not to put ourselves also in uh, in that situation intentionally so we don't want to be surrounded by people who constantly you know attack us or say mean things about us and put us down because then actually everything is dependently arisen so it's very likely that we will start uh, taking on those views, taking on the that um, sort of insecurity. So most of the time we want to be in a healthy, as much as possible environment uh, that is supportive towards our, you know, supportive for our mental health. And then that will build the strength for us to be capable of dealing skillfully in with in circumstance with with people in circumstances where um, you know, they're less ideal, they might have lots of prejudices, um, you know, about us. I remember once I was, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I went to a particular country and in that country, just women are not considered, they're not relevant. So whatever they're saying, 
they're completely ignored. So I was ignored the entire time. And I had many expectations of being considered the entire time. And I was very much used to people listening to me. <laughs> it was also funny because at a certain point I met uh, with a woman who was married to an American man and had lived in America for a while. And I remember her seeing us, asking us where we were. And when it came out America, she, she said, Oh, America, I remember that time I was there. Everybody was interested in what I had to say. And I was like, yes, I know. I remember those times. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's very interesting. But, you know, if I would be there my entire time, um, then definitely my experience would be different, which was different, actually, after a while being there. Then I was very insecure. I was very much... Um, yeah, having a lot of, of suffering and the condition was very difficult for me to practice the Dhamma. So we have to be realistic also where we're at and what is conducive. And so in that moment, though, it was actually a really incredible teaching because I realized that um, all of these things, once again, are dependently arisen. So we have to put together the the ingredients first if we want a particular result this being said we shouldn't also be have this utopia that all the time we're going to be in the quote quote safe space because samsara is not a safe space um it's actually a hell realm <laughs> to a certain degree <laughs> so there's um i mean it's a hell realm with a lot of cheesecake and like brownies and whatnot but <laughs> still <laughs> for the most part an unpleasant um an unpleasant state so being realistic while also being wise with what we're doing is what um comes to mind thank you right and leah hi um i was actually gonna type this in the chat box but I, um i'm gonna say this nikki i really like your style uh you could be on the cover of vogue magazine <laughs> I think Aya Soma uh, will agree with me having worked in fashion. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Where are you from? I'm from uh, I'm from uh, Molise. I'm ah, not... okay. It's so Italiana. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where are you from? Italia. Ah, I know. Where about in Italy? Uh, my parents live in Rome. Okay, so we're not far from each other originally. <laughs> huh? We are very close to each other because, yes. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to say something else, and I've been thinking about this during your talk, but I, I think about this often because obviously, like you, I was brought up as a Catholic and I, um, I was very interested in religion since I was a little girl. And so I, you know, went to catechism. And, you know, the struggle of bikunis is really like this. And I'm also very interested in, you know, women's empowerment in the world you know I have my own business and I always try and get involved with you know empowering the female energy in the world so um it seems to me that the struggle of bikunis is the struggle well, the struggle it's a, not quite the right word but it is uh, the struggle of, uh, of, of women in in general uh, uh as as a um, as it is in Christianity and because you, you, you're talking about how being born, reborn as a woman is bad karma. Uh, well, you know, I mean, in the Old Testament, it does say that women uh, were condemned because they gave uh, Adam the apple and they were going to give birth and be in great pain, you know, so the women had to pay for it. So it seems to me that it's, uh, it's a kind of a uh, it's a common denominator and it's sort of like a, it is, a, you know, a thread and all across the world in, you know, in all sorts of spheres of life. Um, and, and, and it's also interesting because you were talking about how a woman, um, women feels, feel less confident, you know, we do. And, uh, and, and I think men, uh, have more confidence. I, I'm actually a tourist guide and I have a company and I do tours of London and I had a client who was a very difficult client and um, I had two female guides with this client for two days and I had a, a male guide the last day and the two girls were they were all like Leah I'm not sure how the tour went she was very difficult I mean I tried really hard I tried my best and then I had this was a couple and then the guy 
um, the last tour or tour guide, he said to me, Leah, it was fine, it was a dodo, you know, it was great, you know, I just like, everything was fine, you know, I don't know what, there was no problem for me. And, and I said to him, I said, well, this is really strange because Laura and Ruth had a problem with these clients. And he said to me, well, Leah, I'm at the top of the pecking order, you know, I'm at the top of the food chain. I'm a, I'm a man and I'm white. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> So women have less, a naturally less confidence because I think it's a conditioning, as you said, you know? Because uh, when I was born, when I was little, you know, if, if my brother is the first born and, you know, the man is, you know, the man is the man. <laughs> so uh, as you said, it's, it's, it's a conditioning. Of, yeah, of, but it's also impermanent. So that's where it's very interesting to uh, see the teachings of the Buddha. So while I want to clarify one thing that you said, so while in Buddhist circles, we might hear that it's bad karma to be born as a woman, um, it's not actually present in the texts. No, um, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, so it's something a bit different from Abrahamic religions. It's also very important to highlight that the Buddha actually created the monastic order uh, in Buddhism. It's not a later quote unquote invention or creation uh, like it was in Christianity where Jesus never actually established any order it was the church is something later so there's um a lot to uh sort of search and see and of course it's been 2500 years of of buddhist history and something has been well preserved and something was not and we see also in the old texts that actually the buddha um in the sandaka sutta for example he says precisely that um, that uh, to Sandaka, he says, you know, if someone is a traditionalist, some things are preserved well, some things are not preserved well. And the Buddha also gave us instructions on how to identify what is Dhamma from what is Adhamma. So from what is the teachings of the Buddha to what is not the teachings of the Buddha. And so all of the, the once one kind of gets into the lines of studying early Buddhism, studying the different traditions that are currently um, uh, accessible to us. That's also why, by the way, our monastery, Empty Cloud Monastery, is a non-sectarian monastery. It's incredible, incredibly beautiful to actually see how each, um, you know, tradition is similar and slightly different at the same time. And what is similar actually has, uh, yeah, it's usually in, based on Dhamma. And also when it comes to Mahayana as well, by the way. Like, you know, everyone bows, for example. <laughs> but then when you get into sort of the proper etiquette that um, usually women are supposed to um, have when going to the temple, it varies from, from Buddhist culture to Buddhist culture, from Buddhist, from Mahayana to Theravada, also within Theravada, what is acceptable, you know, in Sri Lanka is unacceptable in Thailand. <laughs> Uh, some forms that are acceptable, like in, in uh, making offerings to the Sangha in Thailand are um, unacceptable in Burma and vice versa. So like it's all over the place. And then you can actually pinpoint it. You can study history and see how these things are dependently arisen. So there's oof, a lot of uh, work. Actually, I recommend two, two books, uh, Buddhism After Patriarchy from Gerda Lerner uh, to learn more about actually the specifics within the Buddhist tradition. Uh, she was a historian, feminist and Buddhist, who, uh, but she was a practitioner, Buddhist practitioner. So that book was very useful for me to understand um, these implications. And for those who are interested in uh, Christianity, um, or the origin, the creation of patriarchy, because as every single sankara is impermanent, so is patriarchy impermanent. So there was a beginning. And the creation of patriarchy by Gerda Lerner, it's not a Buddhist book, but it's actually very useful to understand, at least in the Western world, how all of these things have come into being. But in, the, in Buddhism after patriarchy, there's very much actually all the outlines of how Confucianism, Brahmanism, all of these different isms have uh, influenced uh, Buddhism. And Janaki says, I cannot accept the fact that women are less confident. I found them very confident, stable, and strong minds. Yeah, uh, I agree. It's not one single thing that is uh, permanent or that defines women, but rather uh, it is true that there is a conditioning uh, that comes. But, you know, in a place like the United States, I would say usually 
<laughs> um, it depends on different different environments, but definitely it's actually quite the opposite. I've never met so many uh, confident women of all sorts of backgrounds too. Uh, I think I've also become a little bit more confident being here in the United States. Um, but yeah, in a place like Italy, definitely, you know, it's a mix. We're confident in certain domains and less confident in certain domains, not because we're inherently like that, but just because obviously the culture kind of puts us in shape. It's a little bit like also how I speak like this, you know, it's dependently a reason from being born in Italy. <laughs> and uh, Judith, if you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Ayasoma. This has been a very enlightening um, talk. Very, very interesting day, very. Um, I do wanna address a couple of things that I've experienced as an American woman who uses her hands to talk and is not Italian, <laughs> um, but I am older. And um, I've seen a lot in this country and right now in the United States, women need to be very, very careful we are experiencing a, a, an evolution of cultural barbarism. And I mean that quite literally. When you look at what's going on politically and, and women's rights and women's issues in the United States, that is being targeted to trivialize and minimalize women's experience as we are developing. We have only had civil rights since 1920 for women in this, in this country. And basically they didn't go into effect until the 1960s, 1970s. Um, keep an eye on that because many of our younger women who seem to have a great deal of confidence are the same individuals who are yielding to a lot of the threats and intimidations and are not bothering to think about the ethics behind that. Um, that this is not, this is a distractive tool, the titles that, think, that are being given to things. Um, I feel that that was important to say, I have a very small grasp of the Dharma, but you made things so much clearer today for me and, and, and Leah and Kelly have been, uh, and Derek have been very helpful to me, whether they are aware of it or not. Um, Ageism in the United States is growing and ageism towards women is, is becoming more prevalent as well. So if this is happening here where we, we think we're all it, and we do, I mean, Americans do, we think we've got it by the tail. We don't, um, we have, we are a very, very young nation and understanding from the basis of the Dharma is, is hard here, um, but it's growing. People want this, people want ethics, people want their lives simplified. And I am grateful to be getting a journey with individuals who are supportive and understanding of my ignorance and my desire to grow and the limitations that my culture has placed on me because I don't know that I'm looking at things the wrong way. I think I'm right because I'm important and I'm an American and yeah, no, no. Um, but we are afraid that if we, if we go that way, then we'll lose even more. We just won't acknowledge the flaws. We, we are afraid of acknowledging our limitations because that makes us vulnerable. And I think that, that, that individuals such as yourself that are here in our world will make a tremendous difference as bikunis. And I thank you for being one. And I thank everyone. And I'm done now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith, for, for sharing that. And um, yeah, uh, it's um, that's the, the thing with history. We're very fast at forgetting. <laughs> both actually as a species, but also as, as people, you know, we tend to forget what needs to be remembered and we tend to remember what needs to be forgotten. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, actually prior to Buddhist practice, to be quite frank, I was also uh, one of the, the women that was reaping lots of benefits of all the, the work that had been done from uh, fellow women in the past and was taking it for granted until actually it was removed 
from my experience and I was first in shock and was suffering a lot because of it and yeah and at the same time it's been a blessing in disguise to actually even figure out what gender is what are the implications and what is the process how does the process of discrimination happen in the mind uh, of others and also myself so it's also very important I really appreciate how your your reflections also based not on gender that can happen also you know in in women's um, minds that can be uh, perhaps thoughts of cultural superiority or thoughts of uh, age superiority or inferiority. Like there's so many different meters that we can pick that uh, in order to essentially relate ourselves in a superior or inferior level to others. And all of those, obviously, you know, they will completely be erased with enlightenment, but it's not that it happens overnight. We actually have to identify them, see them, and work on them because they're present in each one of us, um, whether we're women, men, transgender folks, and and so forth. Like these are, you know, the, those kilesas that <laughs> that we really need to identify and work. And thanks to Manari also um, in the chat that um, shared about the culture, the conditions put when young, small boys are praised as leaders and girls are called bossy and criticized. So the conditions lead to being less confident. Exactly, when we start pinpointing it, but without actually feeling um, as victims, because it's also important not to take on that identity as victims and that uh, the whole world is conspiring towards us, but rather just seeing it as dependent origination. Okay, these conditions come into being, well, I want something else. Okay, now that I know where that comes from, <laughs> <laughs> then <laughs> I don't want the lack of confidence. I want confidence because confidence is something that is going to help me towards the path of awakening. Well, let me put some other conditions in place for myself and others. So, you know, for example, that for me was the reasoning of being the co-creator of Empty Cloud, where we try to address, um, you know, to create a community that is supportive in that one thing. Janaki also says, culture is not just one strict confinement for a set of rules or behaviors of the human beings. People can create anything. I never experienced or heard from anyone where I was brought up that boys should be leaders or bosses, but they have been asked or given the responsibility to take care of the girls. So within a country, society, culture, there may be so many differences. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's so intricate. Like it's um, not one... It's not black and white. It's not as easy <laughs> as that. There are so many different. That's why it's not one cause produces one effect, um, but everything is dependently arisen. So again, that very intricate, but also fun. You know, we can see it as a fun thing to see um, what are all these um, things that come into being. It's four or five here. Uh, so I believe that Derek, <laughs> who's a lot more in time than I am, uh, the British are more on, on time. <laughs> Uh, you're right. Yes, I think we could keep this going for a, a few more hours and I think there wouldn't be an end for the questions. But thank you so much, Isoma, for talking with us and for your generosity, not just tonight, but also many times over the course of this year for being with us and for teaching us and for inspiring us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all of you for practicing the Dhamma and for inviting me. And um, may you be all may you all be well and happy and may all good things come to you. And I'm glad that uh, Venerable Chanda will be joining you all soon, right? In a few weeks. That's right. Yes. Uh, the first talk for Venerable Chanda will be hopefully on the 30th of October at a different time of 9 a.m. for the UK time. <laughs> so Great. we look forward to hearing about her retreat a little bit. Excellent. And if anybody would like to find out more about Isoma's work and Isoma's monastery then please visit buddhistinsights.org or emptycloud.org and for Anukampa project you all know the website by now i'm sure anukampaproject.org but there was also a newsletter that was sent today so if you didn't receive it please check your spam box because this contains lots of information about what's going on in the future so thank you very much see you next week and have a very good week i hope <laughs>